For those of you who have read my paper on the ontological difference between medieval Europe and the Atlanticist West, as well as my paper Self-Determination of the Peoples, The Important Lessons of Soviet Russia and Imperial Japan, it should come as no surprise that political ideologies may not necessarily couple well with geopolitical ambitions and realities. Sometimes, what is most politically expedient may not be easy to justify within the framework of certain political ideologies. Whenever this happens, an ideologically driven state must either account for this publicly in an honest way, or engineer some kind of deceptive pretext to justify its already secretly chosen path of action. Regardless, this reveals that an ideologically charged state accompanies within her statecraft just as much a set of weaknesses as she does strengths, and that regardless of how she may deal with this matter, she must ultimately always be driven by geopolitical pragmatism, using political ideology only as a tool to serve this purpose, and never falling into the self-crippling error of reversing its priorities. To answer the question, was Adolf Hitler a Eurasianist, one must first understand that Hitler was a civilizationist advocating for a civilization state despite pretending to be a republican and a believer in the liberal bourgeois concept of the nation state. But what then is a civilization state? In a simple word, it means empire. Empire not in the sense of a commercial and merchant sea power like Britain, America or Carthage, but rather a traditional aristocratic land power like Russia, Japan or Rome. To be a Eurasianist, one must be a civilizationist, and if one can prove that Hitler was a civilizationist, then one comes one step closer to answering the main question of whether Adolf Hitler was a Eurasianist or not. According to Leon de Grel, Hitler was asked by him during the war where he thought the homeland was expecting him to respond with Europe. Hitler instead responded with Greece. De Grel states that on another occasion, Hitler claimed to be Greek himself. The strange response reveals that Hitler was rather quite philosophically driven, and any further investigations reveal that Hitler has a very idealist ontology driving his interpretation of history, and the development and inheritance of social identity over time. In his German declaration of war speech against the United States of America on December the 11th of 1941, Adolf Hitler stated the following. Was ist Europa? Es gibt keine geografische Definition unseres Kontinents, sondern nur eine volkliche und kulturelle. Nicht der Ural ist die Grenze dieses Kontinents, sondern immer jene Linie, die das Lebensbild des Westens und dem des Ostens trennt. Es gab eine Zeit, da war Europa jedes griechische Eiland, in das nordische Stämme vorgedrungen waren, um von dort aus zum ersten Mal ein Licht anzuzünden. Das heißt denn, langsam aber stetig die Welt der Menschen zur Hell begann. Dass sie die Griechen den Einbruch der persischen Eroberer abwerfen, da verteidigen sie nicht ihre engere Heimat, die Griechenland war, sondern jenen Begriff, der heute Europa heißt. Und dann wanderte Europa von Hellas nach Rom. Mit dem griechischen Geist und der griechischen Kultur verbanden sich römisches Denken und römische Staatskunst. Ein Weltreich wurde geschaffen, das auch heute noch in seiner Bedeutung und fortzeugenden Kraft nicht bereit, geschweige denn getroffen wird. Ist. Als aber die römischen Legionen gegenüber dem afrikanischen Ansturm Karthagos in drei schweren Kriegen Italien verteidigten und endlich den Sieger fochten, war es wieder nicht Rom, wir dachten könnten, sondern dass die griechisch-römische Welt umfassende damalige Europa. 
Der nächste Eindruck gegen diesen Heimatboden der neuen menschlichen Kultur erfolgte aus den Weiten des Ostens. Ein furchtbarer Strom kulturloser Horden ergoss sich aus dem Inneren Asiens bis tief in das Herz des heutigen europäischen Kontinents. Brennen, singen und morden als wahre Geisel des Herrn. Der Schlacht auf den katalonischen Feldern traf zum ersten Mal in einem Schicksalskampf von unabsehbarer Bedeutung Römer und Germanen gemeinsam seine Kultur ein, die von den Griechen ausgehend über die Römer hinweg nur mehr auch die Germanen in ihren Band gezogen hatte. From this portion of his Declaration of War speech, one can comfortably assume that Hitler did, in fact, have a civilizationist view of social identity, and that despite his rhetoric about nationalism, he was, at heart, someone who transcended the follies of dogmatic nationalism. We know that Hitler had no qualms in doing what he thought was necessary in order to unite the different regions of Germany as Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer, or in English, one folk, one empire, one leader. And so it should come as no surprise that Hitler would expand this empire to include more peoples in the world who occupied territories and contained necessary resources that are vital in securing this great land power against the looming threats of Britain and America. One may now object here for a moment by suggesting that it was the developmental context of another world war that was pushing Hitler to acquire more territory and resources, and that he never initially had any ambitions to establish Germany as a civilization state and empire on the level of Britain, France, Russia and America. However, this claim is laid to rest when one simply reads what he stated at the end of chapter 13 and the beginning of chapter 14 of Mein Kampf. Quote, we National Socialists must go still further. The right to land and soil becomes a duty when a great nation seems destined to go under, unless its land is extended. Germany will either be a world power or not at all. But in order to become a world power, it needs that size which gives it the necessary importance today and gives life to its citizens." End quote. Quote, Therefore, we National Socialists have purposely drawn a line through our pre-war conduct of foreign policy. We resume where we left off, six centuries ago. We put an end to the perpetual Germanic march towards the south and west of Europe, and turn our eyes towards the land of the east. We finally shut off the colonial and trade policy of pre-war times, and pass over to the land policy of the future. But when we speak of new land and soil in Europe today, we must principally think of Russia and its subject border states." End quote. Quote, Our task, and the mission of the National Socialist Movement, is to develop the political insight in our people that will enable them to realize that their future aim is not the fulfillment of some new and wildly adventurous march of Alexander, but rather as the industrious labor of the German plow, for which the sword will provide the soil. End quote. Based on these statements, it becomes rather quite evident that Hitler was a civilizationist who outright declared that Germany would either be a great land power empire in the world or would not exist at all. This ultimatum was driven, of course, by his understanding of history and how all great empires around Europe, especially the British Empire, would never tolerate the growth of Germany in peace and that Germany would either have to rise to match Britain as an equal or better or perpetually suffer the consequences of failing to do so. Hitler's strong geopolitical ambitions were driven by a recognition of the perpetual existential threat that Britain would pose to Germany and the German people. After all, it was only about a century prior that France had gone through a similar situation thanks to the insights of Napoleon Bonaparte, the historical figure who most strongly influenced Hitler's own geopolitical maneuverings. It is said that Hitler was heavily influenced by the Third Reich jurist and political philosopher Karl Schmitt. Some claim that Hitler was inspired by Karl Schmitt's concept of geopolitical large spaces. However, others say that Schmitt simply fleshed out the idea based on what he actually got from Hitler directly. Whatever may be the case, it cannot be understated that the American expansionist doctrine of manifest destiny greatly influenced the German expansionist doctrine of Lebensraum. In fact, one may go even a step further and say that geopolitically, Adolf Hitler wanted what Count Kudenhof Kalergi advocated for with his Pan-Europa idea, and then after that, Pierre Dru La Rochelle in his book Fascist Socialism, 
and Sir Oswald Mosley with his Europe a Nation idea. Eventually, all these streams of thought gave rise to the European Union, which is today the fulfillment of Kalergi, Hitler, La Rochelle, Mosley thought. The EU structure is highly autocratic, and if Europe could free herself of the liberal democratic stranglehold that the globalist American empire has on her, then the EU could fulfill that which Adolf Hitler, Count Kudenhof Kalergi, Pierre Dreux, La Rochelle, and Sir Oswald Mosley all advocated for, namely, a united large space land empire and sovereign civilization state with Germany as the heart. During the Second World War, it became clear to Hitler that Germany's geopolitical objectives would mirror that of Napoleonic France. The Germans would fight in North Africa as well as the Middle East, and even attempt to push as far east as India with the goal of driving the British out of the subcontinent. Hitler had ordered that once Russia had fallen, the Wehrmacht would continue its advance all the way to India. For those who accept geopolitics as a legitimate form of study, the state is indeed an organism. In the run-up to and during the Second World War, this belief was very appealing for some scholars in Germany and Japan. If a state is an organism, then it will do that fourth thing I identified, it will grow. Indeed, if a state is an organism, then it needs to grow. It's entirely natural for it to do so. We should expect it to grow, because that's what organisms do. So it would be wrong for us to prevent it from doing so, and we should feed it to help it grow. With this simple idea, we have the intellectual justification for the living space arguments. What the Germans in the Second World War would refer to as Lebensraum, and the Japanese would refer to as Saikatsuken. By saying that the state is an organism, we have given academic justification for German and Japanese annexation in the Second World War. The man with whom that academic justification was chiefly associated, at least in Germany, is Karl Haushofer. Much has been written about Haushofer's impact on Hitler's thinking, and there's still disagreement today. But as an indication of Haushofer's close association with the Nazi regime, it's worth point pointing out that Rudolf Hess, the deputy Führer, was one of Haushofer's students. And indeed, Haushofer was one of the best men at Hess's wedding to Inge Prohl, the other being Adolf Hitler. Karl Ernst Haushofer was a German general, professor, geographer and diplomat. Haushofer's concept of Geopolitik influenced the ideological development of Adolf Hitler. Rudolf Hess was also a student of Haushofer, and during Hess and Hitler's incarceration by the Weimar Republic after the Beer Hall Putsch, Haushofer visited the Landsberg prison to teach and mentor both Hess and Hitler. Haushofer also coined the political use of the term Lebensraum, which Hitler later actively used in his own political rhetoric. Haushofer belonged to a family of artists and scholars. He was born in Munich to Max Haushofer, a well-known professor of economics, politician and author of both academic and literary works. In 1887, Haushofer entered the 1st Field Artillery Regiment, Prinz Regent Leopold, of the Bavarian Army and completed the Kriegsschule, or War School, the Artillerieschule, or Artillery School, and War Academy in the Kingdom of Bavaria. In November of 1908, Haushofer was ordered to Tokyo as a military attaché to study the Imperial Japanese Army and to serve as a military advisor in artillery instruction. He traveled with his wife via India and Southeast Asia and arrived in February of 1909. He was received by Emperor Meiji and became acquainted with many important people in politics and the Japanese armed forces. In the autumn of 1909, he traveled with his wife for a month to Korea and Manchuria on the occasion of a railway construction. In June of 1910, they returned to Germany via Russia and arrived one month later. However, shortly after returning to Bavaria, he began to suffer from a severe lung disease and was given leave from the army for three years. His years in Imperial Japan left a huge impression on him, shaping his geopolitical worldview until the end of his life. This Great Depression in 1929 had a devastating impact on Japan, and Japanese nationalists blamed the attachment to Western values. Made by Swerve. 
the Russian philosopher Alexander Dugin states, quote, In Japan, Haushofer saw the clearest example of a traditionalist society that fully preserved the hierarchy, the military samurai caste system, the values of loyalty and honor, contempt for death, and the duty of sacrifice for the sake of the nation, which was seen as something far superior to the individual as a special spatial ethnic organism incomparably superior to any concept of an individual." End quote. Haushofer remarked in his own words the following about Japan. Quote, Japan, the land of the rising sun, the world of tradition, the cult of ancestors, the cult of the elements, the sun, the moon, water, mountains, streams, groves, the unique etiquette of the samurai, a warlike and heroic nation mobilized for a common and total service to the highest solar ideal. All this contrasted sharply with what we see in our homeland, in Germany and in Europe as a whole. Cosmopolitan cities, selfishness, capitalism, the market, venality, oblivion of higher ideals. But at the same time, how close is Japan to the romantic soul of a German patriot, in love with German myths and legends, full of nostalgia for that golden feudal age when tradition flourished on the European continent, the age of knights, holy empires, and magical kings." End quote. Alexander Dugin further states about Haushofer, quote, Haushofer's main orientations crystallize precisely in Japan. It is here that the intellectual formation of the one who will become the greatest geopolitician of the 20th century takes place. In Tokyo, Karl Haushofer receives his initiation. He becomes a member of the mysterious Japanese Order of the Green Dragon, about which so many incredible legends will be spread in the occult circles of the West. The dragon is a symbol, René Gugnon, undoubtedly the highest authority on the symbolism of the tradition, emphasizes that in the Far Eastern tradition, the symbol of the dragon represents heavenly logos, that is, the highest spiritual and therefore purely positive instance of religious cosmology." End quote. During his convalescence from 1911 to 1913, Haushofer would work on his doctorate of philosophy from Munich University for a thesis on Japan titled Dai Nihon, Betrachtungen über Großjapans Wehrkraft, Weltstellung und Zukunft, or in English, Reflections on Greater Japan's Military Strength, World Position and Future. He established himself as one of Germany's foremost experts regarding the Far East and co-founded the geopolitical monthly Zeitschrift für Geopolitik, or Magazine for Geopolitics in English, which he would co-edit until it was suspended towards the end of World War II. After recovering from his health problems, Haushofer continued serving in the army of Imperial Germany and returned to teach war history at the military academy in Munich. During World War I, he commanded a brigade on the Western Front, but he was disillusioned with Germany's readiness for the tests of warfare. When the United States entered the war, it cemented a bitter hatred of Americans within Haushofer. On one occasion, Haushofer described Americans as, quote, deceitful, ravenous, hypocritical, shameless beasts of prey, end quote. On another occasion, he wrote, quote, Americans are truly the only people in this world that I regard with a deep, instinctive hatred." End quote. He further stated, quote, I would rather die as a European than exist as an American. End quote. German anti-Americanism tends to couple together with anti-Semitism, and this was no different with Haushofer. Haushofer developed an especially virulent strain of anti-Semitic feeling. In letters to his wife Martha, whose own father was Jewish, Haushofer wrote of Jewish, quote, treason against folk and fatherland, end quote. He repeated the then commonly held anti-Semitic beliefs in Germany alleging that Jews declined to fight for their country of citizenship and that they were guilty of war profiteering. The solution to these ills besetting Germany, he declared, would be a powerful and charismatic leader. Enthusiastically, he wrote, quote, a man, a kingdom, an imperial crown for a man worthy of the name." End quote. On another occasion, he wrote to his wife Martha, quote, You see how ready for a Caesar I am? End quote. In the same letter, he stated, quote, And what kind of a good instrument I would be for a Caesar, if we had one, and if he knew how to make use of me? End quote. Haushofer would both find and influence Germany's next Caesar. 
After retiring from the army with the rank of General Major in 1919, he forged a friendship with the young Rudolf Hess who became his scientific assistant and later rose up to be the deputy leader of the Nazi party, second in authority only to Hitler. In 1919, Haushofer successfully defended his second dissertation and became Privatdozent for Political Geography at Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich and was made a professor in 1933, although he declined a formal position and salary because that would have affected his military pension. Haushofer entered academia with the aim of restoring and regenerating Germany. He believed that the Germans' lack of geographical knowledge and geopolitical awareness to be a major cause of Germany's defeat in World War I, because Germany had found itself with a disadvantageous alignment of allies and enemies. His specialty was to combine the fields of geography, history, economics, demography, political science and anthropology into a new discipline that came to be called Geopolitik. Haushofer himself could not plainly describe this new science, but its principal thrust was the view of the state as a person or organism shaped over time by its unique geography and history into a specific national character. In this context, he coined the term Lebensraum, or room to live, to describe the territory that a healthy and expanding state needed to sustain its population. This view formed the foundation of Hitler's geopolitical goals. In 1923, Hitler was jailed following his failed beer hall putsch, and Rudolf Hess surrendered to be imprisoned alongside his leader in the Landsberg prison. Haushofer became a teacher of politics and philosophy to both Hess and Hitler. According to scholar Holger Herwig, quote, Like a dry sponge, Hitler soaked up what Haushofer offered, end quote. Every Wednesday between June the 24th and December the 12th of 1924, Professor Dr. Haushofer made the 100-kilometer long round trip from Munich to Landsberg. Once each morning and once each afternoon he offered what he called the Young Eagles, Hess and Hitler, hours of intense personal mentoring. Joachim Fest, Hitler's most prolific biographer, stated, quote, Bringing Haushofer and Hitler together is the most important personal contribution that Rudolf Hess made to the creation and the face of National Socialism." End quote. Haushofer's son, Albrecht, considered that his father's most powerful contribution to Hess and Hitler was his own substantial credibility as a soldier and scholar. Albrecht wrote, quote, One has to imagine what it meant in the Bavaria of that time when a man of my father's stature and popularity constantly traveled out to Landsberg. End quote. From 1925 to 1931 and from 1933 to 1939, Haushofer broadcasted monthly radio lectures on the international political situation. That Weltpolitischer Monatsbericht, or World Politics Monthly Report, made him a household name in contemporary Germany, and he came to be known in circles far removed from academia. He was a founding member of the Deutsche Akademie, or German Academy of which he served as president from 1934 to 1937. He was a prolific writer, publishing hundreds of articles, reviews, commentaries, obituaries, and books, many of which were on Asian topics, and he arranged for many leaders in the Nazi party and in the German military to receive copies of his works. After the establishment of the German Nazi government, Haushofer remained friendly with Hess. During the pre-war years, Haushofer was instrumental in linking Japan to the Axis powers, acting in accordance with the theories in his arguably most famous book, Geopolitics of the Pacific Ocean. Quote, Karl Haushofer closely associates with the Japanese samurai elite. He discusses the secret of the origin of samurai traditions, learns about the strange proximity of ancient Japanese symbols with the runic signs of the European North, Haushofer's homeland. Gradually, before his eyes, a whole picture of the ancient unity is built, some kind of forgotten civilization of heroes and warriors uniting the expanses of Eurasia in a single spiritual political synthesis. This is how Haushofer laid the foundations for what would later become his life's work, the theory of the geopolitical unification of Eurasia into a continental bloc, from the Azores to Tokyo." End quote. Haushofer was a thoroughly convinced Eurasianist who believed in the necessary geopolitical unity between Germany, Japan, and all territory in between. 
In a very real sense, Haushofer was the German equivalent of Halford Mackinder, with the only difference being that Mackinder was a liberal who saw Asia as the great enemy of English freedom, while Haushofer was an anti-liberal traditionalist who saw Asia as the original homeland and wellspring of German folkism. Mackinder emphasizes the need for Britain to divide Europe and control her as a buffer against the East, while Haushofer emphasizes the need for Germany to unify Europe and march towards the East in order to protect herself against the West. This contrast between the two positions can best be understood through the dichotomy of Atlanticism versus Eurasianism. Liberal sea power seeks to exploit Europe in order to conquer Eurasia. A liberal land power seeks to secure Europe against the aggression of Atlantis, that would be Britain and America. Europe is the great geopolitical battleground between liberal Atlantis and illiberal Eurasia, the progressive white supremacism of the West against the traditional Aryan power of the East. On the 29th of May 1937, a pair of Tupolev SB Soviet bombers attached to the Spanish Republican Air Force raided nationalist air bases and the port of Ibiza in the Mediterranean Sea. The aircraft departed from the airbase of Los Alcazares near Cartagena. The German heavy cruiser Deutschland, which was part of the International Non-Intervention Committee patrol, was anchored off Ibiza and was allegedly misidentified by the bomber's crew as the nationalist heavy cruiser Canarias. Two Soviet pilots, Captain Anton Prognorin and Lieutenant Vasily Schmidt, dropped their bombs on the Deutschland, causing large fires on the ship and killing 31 sailors and wounding 74. This event is today known as the Deutschland Incident. In regards to this incident, Haushofer's son Albrecht remarked the following in a response to Rudolf Hess, quote, One cannot avoid the conclusion that they, the British, regard neither Italy nor Japan, nor even the Soviet Union, as public enemy number one. They are once again glaring across the North Sea, at Germany, end quote. Perhaps this is exactly why peace with Britain was ultimately impossible and an existential war had to be fought between the white Englishman of the Western spirit and the Aryan German of the Eastern spirit. Quote, Hess immediately asked about the possibilities of conveying the Fuhrer's sincere wish for peace to leading British personages. It's clear that, if the war goes on, they will be committing suicide. The Fuhrer neither has nor had any desire to destroy the British Empire. Is there anybody in Britain ready to talk peace? Haushofer used blunt language in his reply. It was not just the Jews and Freemasons, but virtually every Englishman who regards any treaty signed by Hitler as worthless. Why? asked Hess, genuinely puzzled. Haushofer pointed to the broken treaties that littered the last decade. In the English-speaking world, the Führer is regarded as the devil's deputy on earth. When he added that the British would rather convey their empire piecemeal to the Americans than allow Germany to dominate Europe, Hess heatedly asked why. The diplomat pointed out that Churchill himself, being of half-American blood, like several members of his cabinet, would have few qualms in that respect. Reverting to Hess's original question, he said, my view is that the British, who have property they stand to lose, that is, the more calculating elements of the plutocracy, are those likely to talk about peace, but even these will only regard peace as a temporary truce. To this, Hess responded, Do you think our feelers haven't been getting through to them? That we have been using the wrong language? It was obvious that he was referring to Ribbentrop, who wanted to instead ally with the Soviets and maintain a friendship with Stalin. End quote. Quote, the day the Germans, Japanese, and Russians unite will be the last day of Anglo-Saxon hegemony. End quote. Haushofer wanted to free the three great peoples of the future, namely the Germans, the Russians, and the Japanese from the strangulation that the Anglo-Saxon powers had prepared for them. According to Haushofer, the energies of the Russian bear should be channeled towards the south, towards India without spilling over into the German space in the West or the Japanese space in the East. The imperialism of the dollar was, for Haushofer, the principal external enemy since the day Germany was humiliated in Versailles. Faced with the new order that the Bolshevik power had constituted in Moscow, Haushofer was ambivalent. 
He rejected the Bolshevik style and practice, but he conceded that they had liberated Russia, and intended to liberate all peoples in the future, from the slavery of banks and capital. When one considers these facts, one cannot help but come to the conclusion that Adolf Hitler was indeed a Eurasianist, deeply influenced by his friend and mentor in geopolitics, Karl Haushofer. One cannot escape from the reality that National Socialism was an Eastern worldview, masked with a veneer of modernist and Western language and concepts, but nevertheless traditional and anti-Western at its deepest core. The Germans saw in the Japanese far more than just a useful ally, but rather their spiritual twin and destiny. A people who were related to them in the eternal realm of spirit and will, unlike the oppositional strangers of Britain and America. The entire basis of the National Socialist worldview is blood and soil. Europe, Eurasia and Asia share a common soil that shapes the soul of all peoples that inhabit the rimland that surrounds the Eurasian heartland. It is Britain and America who are cut off by the waters of the English Channel and the Atlantic Ocean, and thus it is no wonder that the spirit of these sea powers is so antithetical to the spirits of the East. It is not Eurasia that attacks Europe, but Atlantis. According to Haushofer, for Europe to properly defend itself against Atlantis, the Eurasianist project must come to fruition. Adolf Hitler recognized this and served as the instrument of Karl Haushofer's geopolitics. Nazi Germany's attempt to dominate Europe and establish a German-centered order resulted in the devastations of World War II and ultimately in the crushing defeat of Germany itself. Its quest had been deeply influenced by the ideas of Frederick Ratzel and Karl Hoschhofer, two prominent scholars of the German geopolitical school whose legacy still survives today in the grand strategy of another major power. The geopolitical plans of Nazi Germany were not conceived by Hitler and actually predate the Third Reich itself. In fact, the Nazis took inspiration from the German geopolitical school of the late 19th century whose main representative was Frederick Ratzel. The first important concept in his thinking is that he regarded the state as a living being that throughout its lifetime needs to grow and expand and whose population is tied to its territory by a cultural bond. Along this logic, Ratzel applied the theories of social Darwinism to states. According to his views, states, as all living beings, are in a constant struggle for survival and therefore compete one against the other. This dynamic is analogous to natural selection, meaning that only the most adaptable ultimately endure. In this context, a state must exploit any occasion to expand and become stronger and increase its likelihood to survive. Ratzel was also the first to formulate the concept of Lebensraum in the sense that the Nazis would later use, considering it as a vital space that a state and its population must control to survive and prosper. And as states try to expand, wars break out as a result of this process. Ratzel summarizes his theory in seven laws, which in short said that a state must expand its territory because this leads to economic prosperity, cultural progress and greater influence, that it must seek to take control over economically important regions such as river basins, coasts and plains, and that expansion must be performed by absorbing other lesser polities which are also the expression of inferior civilizations as the latter attract a more powerful state, meaning that the expansion dynamic elements itself as the state grows. After Germany's defeat in World War I, Ratzel theories were revived and readapted by Karl Hoschefer, who was a friend of Rudolf Hess and who had a major influence on the geopolitical views and strategies of the Nazis. According to Hoschefer, Germany had to restore its power by retaking its Lebensraum and by rebuilding its sphere of influence considering borders, as Ratzel had done before, as the expression of the dynamic of expansion of states motivated by the needs of their people. Taking inspiration from the Monroe Doctrine, 
which to simplify stated that European powers did not have the right to meddle in the affairs of South America, thus putting it under America's influence. Hoshofer advocated for a pan-Germanist policy and divided the world into four zones. A pan-American area under US influence, a Eurafrican one dominated by Germany, a pan-Russian zone that also included Iran and India that was obviously to be ruled by Russia, and finally an Asian core prosperity sphere where Japan would dominate over the Asia Pacific and Eastern Siberia. Hoshofa also developed a strategy to counter the maritime powers and notably Great Britain as he was aware that Germany could not realistically compete with them in the naval domain. He believed that Germany had to form a Eurasian bloc along with Russia and Japan in order to counter the British strategy inspired by Mackinder of containing the continental powers by controlling the so-called inner crescent of Eurasia. The impact of Hoshofer's theories on the foreign policy of Nazi Germany is evident. The expansion in Europe and notably in the eastern part of the continent was meant to take control of the Lebensraum and to establish Germany as the leading power in the region. Following Hoshofer's advice, Germany established closer relations with Japan which culminated in 1940 with an alliance treaty after a process that had begun in 1936. The non-aggression pact with the USSR in 1939, with whom the two powers established their respective spheres of influence in Eastern Europe, also followed the logic of aligning with Russia advocated by Hoshofer. Yet this aspect was a point of major contrast with Hitler, who viewed communism as an existential threat. The Fohrer ultimately abandoned it in 1941 by attacking the Soviets, a move that in retrospect brought Germany to defeat. The theories of Ratzel and Hoshofer had an evident influence on the grand strategy of the Third Reich. Central concepts like the Lebensraum, the struggle for supremacy amongst competing peoples, the need to take over new spaces for the population and to make the state stronger, all derived from their works and inspired the nationalist and expansionist policies of Nazi Germany. Yet Germany ultimately suffered a ruinous defeat due to a complex series of factors, including the fact that it did not follow Hoshofer's policy of alignment with Russia and instead attacked it, thus opening a huge front that drained a large portion of its manpower and material resources. Yet the German geopolitical school did not completely fade with Nazi Germany. Somehow, ironically, during the 90s it was revived by Alexander Dugin a Russian thinker whose theories we have already examined in a previous video on our channel called Russia's Geopolitical School. Many of the key concepts that appear in Dugin's work derive from the German school. The central importance of the nation and its territory, the division of the world into four zones, or the strategic objective of controlling Eurasia by establishing strategic partnerships with key regional players, notably Germany and Japan, and later substituted by China, in order to counter the influence of maritime powers. Dugin basically reinterpreted the ideas of the German school in a Russian-centric way and transformed them into a geopolitical theory called Eurasianism, which has a real impact on Russia's grand strategy under President Vladimir Putin. Omar Amine, formerly known as Claudio Muti, was a Nazi Maoist Italian philosopher, political analyst, and associate of Franco Freda and Alexander Dugin. According to him, German geopolitical ambitions must exclude the white race, which he identifies as English, American, and Jewish. Claiming that it is an enemy of National Socialism, he states the following, quote, not only anti-Semites like Wagner and Chamberlain, but also Jews like Weininger noted the relationship between the English type and the Jewish type, if we are to judge by the origin myth that affirms that they are both the descendants of the Israelites. It would be better to abandon the unrealistic views of those within National Socialism, who are still filled with illusions of gaining England to their own side, a nation indisputably of the white race, but the Jews and the Yankees are as well to the benefit of German geopolitical projects." Quote. 
in order to explain to the West that if any truth is re re uh, relative, so we have our special Russian truth. <laughs> Imposed to every people, every state, American system of values without asking. Democrazie plutocratiche e reazionarie dell'Occidente 